Molo Sanbonani, hello, how's it? Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is another episode of Vuganazo, which comes to you weekdays from 7 a.m. My name is Big Daddy Liberty. And uh, remember, if you're liking the show, all you need to do is hit that like button, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, and hit that bell notification so that you're always notified when we post. You can also find us, of course, on our website at www.bigdaddyliberty.com. Hey, let's get straight into the news. All right, first up, we look at a World Bank report that's just come out. That's the Container Port Performance Index of 2021, an important report because it basically compares and assesses the performance of container ports around the world, right? So Durban, Cape Town, for instance, here in South Africa, and it ranks them. And unfortunately, South African ports are amongst the worst in the world with a ranking um, of up to 351 ports. Let me read a nice summary and opinion analysis by R.W. Johnson, one of the more formidable political um, analysts in the country. In his sum summary, he rightly pointed out that the report analyzed South African ports and ports around the world on two bases. The first being an administrative approach and the statistical approach. On that basis, Durban came out at 350 first out of 351, with Mocha at 349, PE 348, and Cape Town at 347. They're plumbing the very bottom here. Uh, he goes on to say, second on that statistical approach I mentioned, um, it's no better. With uh, Ngucha coming in at 351st, dead last, Durban at 349, PE at 348, and Cape Town at 347. These were, by definition, R.W. Johnson continues, by far the lowest rankings in Africa. Now, it gets interesting for me because if you compare South Africa, which is much more well-resourced, a country that has more resources by way of infrastructure too, it shouldn't be doing this poorly compared to, let's say, other African countries where Mombasa in that same report came out 43rd out of 351. And of course, Djibouti, an even poorer uh, uh, region, coming out 93rd. And we're seeing, for example, that this has real-world effects. Consider, for example, that if a port authority can't smoothly and efficiently import and export, facilitate rather, import and export, in what is already an inflationary environment where inflation is going up, where in an environment where already the economy is lagging, it simply affects the ability of a country and economy to grow. It affects the ability of a country to grow jobs even. So the issue becomes this. Should we continue to see state-owned entities, such as Transnet in this case, or ESCOM when it comes to electricity, run these critical functions that maybe the private sector can do better in running? Don't believe me? Spoke to a good mate of mine who, and it's not a trust me bro moment. <laughs> this is a chap who runs an export business out of the Cape Town Harbour. And he told me firsthand when I asked him about this particular issue, that Cape Town is maybe a good litmus test in the sense that Cape Town Harbour, one of its terminals, was leased out by Transnet to a private company. And that particular terminal, run by a private company, is one of the most productive, if not the most productive and sought after by exporters and importers because of its efficiency, compared to the other terminals at the very same harbour, which are run by Transnet and are slow, cumbersome, and full of bureaucracy. Again, should the state be running these functions when the private sector clearly does better? And in other news, and most welcome news, and I'll be brief on this one, the president, Cyril Ramaphosa, appearing on your screens yesterday, uh, introducing a raft of reforms on the energy market. As you'll know, uh, an energy market dominated by a failing state-owned enterprise, ESCOM, and of course, a grid which is on the verge of collapse. And we see that collapse by way of these rolling blackouts. I think the president was rightly responding to public pressure on this issue. And by and large, I like the reforms that he's mentioning, even if they're a little too little too late in some cases. The one area, 
And the one, the primary thread in all these reforms, and the thing that I really want to congratulate him on, even though he's seeing it late, is the private sector. The private sector, we've been saying this, relying on state-owned enterprises to provide electricity is simply foolhardy. You've got to open up the market to the private sector who can do the job of providing electricity much better than any state-owned enterprise run by politicians could ever do. So the fact that most of his reforms yesterday was seeing an ANC politician finally admit effectively their failure and beg the private sector to come on board is absolutely satisfying. So in that regard, it's very good to see this reform heading in this direction. And I know it might get a little bit worse before it becomes better, but we're definitely on the right track. The right track, of course, if they implement what they spoke about in yesterday's address. This and more, of course, we'll keep an eye on on Liberty and Friends this Sunday. We'll have hopefully some experts who will help us talk through some of these proposed interventions. In other news, and one which we'll be very brief about because it is a developing story, it seems Western Cape High Court Judge President U John Chope is one step closer to facing the axe and indeed being potentially the first judge in history in the country to be impeached. That's after following a virtual meeting yesterday by the JSC, that's the Judicial Judicial, pardon me, Service Commission, having voted in favor of recommending that Ramaphosa, the president, in, uh, suspend, pardon me, under the provisions of, um, I think, Section 1773 of the Constitution. This is a massive step and basically, again, reinforces the seriousness with which uh, John Hiope's peers in the judiciary and, of course, at the level of government are taking the allegations facing him. What allegations uh, are, are we uh, talking about here? Let me read from this particular article on this where Hiope previously had launched uh, an, an urgent bid to block his possible suspension by Ramaphosa, uh, pending his later unsuccessful challenge to the JSC process that resulted in him being found guilty of, get this, alleged gross misconduct for attempting to sway two constitutional court justices to rule in favor of then ANC president Jacob Zuma in 2008, close quote. So a serious allegation, therefore, which speaks to the very heart and the integrity of the judiciary, and if things go the way they're going, may very well see John Klopi being the first judge in democratic history to be impeached by his peer. What signal will that send to the rest of the judiciary? Is this a good step? One which, will, of course, will incentivize cleaning up administrations in a judiciary sense? Uh, that question, I think, and more, as, as I said, the story is a developing one and we'll definitely be keeping an eye on it and hopefully chatting about it much more. All right, that's it for this episode of Ivuga Nazo. Remember, if you like the content, you like this format, please do me a favor, hit that like button and please share the show. Have more people see this short, quick format to help them start their news, news day. You can, of course, support Vuganazo and the Big Daddy Liberty Show. Head on over to our website, will you? That's www.bigdaddyliberty.com. And you can see on that page how you can contribute to the show um, and to support the work that we do. You'll find us on all your social media platforms. Just check out the descriptor of the video for more information. With that being said, thanks for watching and I'll see you tomorrow only on the BDL show, Vuganazo.